Isaiah chapter 53, and we're back in verse 6. Isaiah 53, 6, we're going to look at two things in this one verse tonight. We're going to look at the straying sheep, and we're going to look at the sacrificing shepherd. Verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a complete verse this is. I'm afraid this verse is a little neglected and not used as much as it should be. It tells of our sin and it tells of a Savior. It tells of our lost condition, and it tells of what the Lord did at Calvary. It tells what we are prone to do, and what the Lord did to pardon you and I. This one verse really covers it all, and does so very well. As the story is told, it saved a young teenage man his physical life. There was a young man, and you'd know his name if it came to my mind and I mentioned it, but he was saved under the preaching of, of George Whitfield. And, and he went home, and his parents shunned him, and they did not approve of this religious change in his life. So he left home with just his clothes on his back, a Bible, and a hymn book. And next thing you know, he's deep out in the wilderness. He has not very much to eat. He's not getting much sleep. The sleep he is getting is from climbing up into a tree so he can save himself from the beast on the ground. And he went along for a little while, then all of a sudden a Cherokee hunter came upon him and seized him and took him back to their tribe and took him right to the executioner so they could kill him. And right before they did, he started praying. And his prayer so affected the executioner that he took this boy to the chief. And before the chief and everyone around, this boy quoted this verse, Isaiah 53, 6, which opened the door to a witnessing opportunity He was saved from execution. The chief Cherokee was saved from his sins. And after the next couple of days or weeks of of sharing the Bible together, several other were saved from their sins as well. This verse ought to be parked right in our heart beside John 3.16. We ought to memorize it and know it and use it as it ought to be used. We ought to be ready to proclaim this at all times, it's, it's so full and gives everything that we need. I said we're going to look at two things tonight. And the first thing I want us to consider is the straying of the sheep. Beginning of verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Let us first consider an inescapable straying. Notice the beginning of the verse. It says, all we. Now, this was written to Israel. But we know that this is not just for Israel. This is for every single human being. Everyone outside of the Trinity has gone astray from the Lord. And so we're not talking just to Israel. This is true of Israel and everyone. Straying into sin and away from God describes the entire human race. Sin is universal. 
And no one can escape it. Everyone begins in sin. It all started with Adam. We're all sinners by nature. No matter what we do, or how bad we think we do something, or or how minor something is, our nature is sinful. And we've received that from Adam. We're likened unto sheep in this verse. Sheep are animals who are prompted to go astray. And we're likened unto them for very good reason. I mean, we are born the children of wrath, the Bible says. Children of disobedience. We've all sinned. It is certain that that all have fallen short of God's glory. We are all guilty before God. We've all come short of His glory. May we... We may not all identify in the same sins in our lives or have been identified as such. And we may break down different degrees of sinfulness, but ultimately it doesn't mean anything because all have come short of God's glory because of sin in their life. If we all tried to jump off the coast and jump to Hawaii, some some of you may beat me by ten foot. But we're all going to get wet. And ultimately it makes no difference. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. This is an inescapable straying that everyone begins in. But there's also an individual straying that we see in this verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You know, some people can endure what we just shared because it's lumping us up all together in sin. Okay, fine, we're all sinners. We all started out tainted. Yes, we all have a sinful nature. And a lot of people can go along with that. But some people say, whoa, don't, don't get personal with me though now. That's, I was sitting by a preacher at this camp meeting last week and the preacher said something and this preacher next to me said under his breath, now, now you're getting personal, preacher. And he, he didn't like for him to get personal. But the Word of God gets personal. And God had Isaiah to get personal with the people. Everyone. Paul said there is none righteous, no, not one. So as we look at sin is universal. And, and that the whole human race has been affected by sin. And we have a sin nature. There's also something very precise and, and personal for you and I to look at in this. Every single person has a sin nature. Every single person is charged with many sins. There is no such thing as a sin that will not send someone to hell. You know, there are those who believe that. There are those who believe that they have sinned in everyday sin and it's it's not that big a deal. And God doesn't look on it the same. Look, the murderer can go to hell and the bubblegum thief will go to hell too. God's not going to measure out what the murderer has done and the bubblegum thief and say, well, his is so bad, he's going to hell. And his is so light in comparison, I'm going to let him slide. Revelation says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Just just the liar. There's no such thing as a sin that will not send someone to hell. God doesn't weigh that out. We have to get personal. It's an important matter for us to be personal about. You know, what a wonderful day it is. Or maybe what a wonderful day it was. Whenever the general view that that we're all sinners and Jesus died for sin became the personal view that I am a sinner and Jesus died for my sins. As a lost man, I had a perfect record in Sunday school for six months before I was saved. 26 Sundays in in a row, give or take. I knew there was something good going on in this religion, but I I just 
I just didn't have it yet. But but I knew there was something, there had to be something good. So I went to Sunday school every Sunday. And during those six, six months, I clearly learned that all have sinned. I clearly learned that everyone was a sinner. And, and that Jesus died for sin. I learned that. But that didn't get me saved. It was truth. And it's a very good start. But when I look over those six months I had of listening to the truth, unsaved, I, 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 I knew that information just about the whole time. But that morning in Sunday school, after six months, and looking at that morning I was saved before Sunday school was over, the Sunday school lesson got interrupted because the Lord saved me before the lesson was over. And as I think back, I, I love to think about the day that the Lord saved my soul. And, and to think about it, that is my first personal thought. It went beyond, it went beyond that, that we're all sinners and Jesus died for sin. And I remember what was going on in my heart. I am a sinner. And Jesus died for my sin. Oh, what a wonderful day it is when it, this becomes personal in our lives. It's a personal thing our sin is. Someone may help help lead us into sin. Someone may help get our sin nature going real good. What took my brother a few years to, to anchor down in in his sin, he taught me pretty quick. And so I had a crash course in it, and I caught right up with him. Yet, the sin was my responsibility. And for all of us, our sin is our own responsibility. We have an individual nature that sins. It's not just the team. There is an I in this team, if you will, of sinners. Because it must be personal. This straying is, is inescapable for all. And it's individual. It's a singled out straying for every individual. But it's also an independent straying we can consider for a minute tonight. We have turned everyone to his own way. The animal, again, we're likened to is sheep. Sheep are in desperate need of guidance. Sheep have to be guided. If you like cats, I, I'm going to apologize to you right now, but or just ask that you forgive me, whatever. I, I'm not much on cats, though. I don't, don't like them much. And maybe I'm wrong about this because I know so little about them. But what I seem to gather is that cats are, cats are pretty independent. They can do their own thing. You can leave them. It's kind of like they look at you like, don't mess with me. I don't need you. I don't like you. I can clean myself. I, I'll find food. I'll find water. I'm not going to swim in it, but I'll find water to drink. I'll even find milk maybe. I don't know. They just seem to be very independent. The Bible doesn't say all, all we like cats have gone astray. The Bible says all we like sheep. We're likened unto an unintelligent animal. This animal, the sheep, needs to be guided. Needs a guide or things are going to get really, really bad. You know, you put a bunch of sheep together and you back off. And they're all going to go off, most likely, in a completely different direction and keep on going until they're all alone and they have no protection and they are in danger and it just gets worse and worse as they go. But they keep on going and this is the nature of this animal and we are likened to it. This is a picture of people and the way people are. The song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. It started with Adam, and it's been going on ever since. That's the way 
people are. We are wanderers. We we have a propensity to make our own plans, to pursue our own interests, desire to satisfy self. We want to solve our own problems. We want to do it. And that is our problem. We have gone our own way instead of God's way. And it's a sure way to destruction. It's a sure way into deep trouble. And it's the wrong way for counsel. As we think about this animal, the sheep, and you know the qualities of the sheep. I don't need to spill all of this out. But how about some sheep getting together and getting counsel one from another? I mean, what kind of good is that really going to do? What good is that? Yet we're likened unto them. People will go to the worldly educated for counsel and for advice instead of the Word of God. People exalt a limited human intelligence when there is an unlimited God who speaks to us through His Word to guide us into the best life we could possibly have. God told Israel, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts to give you an expected end. In other words, I want the very best for your life. That's what the Word of God will do. But people go to the world for education and advice. And the thing about this is, it's just over and over that it keeps happening. we just turning and a turning of our own way. Generation after generation and century after century, we keep on independently straying, reasoning sinfully instead of looking to God for help. You know, when sheep don't follow the shepherd, thorns, they end up captured and trapped and in bondage. And we get into trouble when we don't follow the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. You know, there's things that will keep us from following the good shepherd. And and one of those things is pride. Pride will cause us to do things our own way. And to say, I've got this. We've got this. Instead of admitting our desperate need before God. I was just talking to Shelly at the house about about pride. And how pride just keeps on trying to hammer you down. I'll tell you what, I'll just be personal with you. This, This sickness has been a spiritual lesson for me. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I, I just felt bulletproof in a lot of ways. I haven't been sick in so long. And yes, I can do two weeks of this stuff. Man, God taught me a lesson. We're a weak people. We're some weak sheep. And we need some help. And, and thank God for those lessons against that pride that, that always try, it always tries to get us. Or, or the pollution around us will cause us to try to do our own things in our own way. As in everyone wanting to give advice. You know, that's something the world has never been short on, is advice. I didn't say good advice. The world's very short on that, but not short on advice. You can get it on every corner. People love to tell you what you ought to do. There is good godly advice, it's rare, but it is, and we ought to take it. And it'll come from Scripture, and it will come from principles from Scripture, and you'll tie it to the Word of God, and we can heed the Word of God when we hear it in good counsel, and we should. But there's a lot of pollution around us in advice. It's time that we heed the Word of God and realize that He guides us By His Word. He guides our everyday life right now by His Word. 
And as we go halfway through this verse, and we have shared up to this point, I'm so glad there's not a period in the middle of this verse. I'm so glad it's not over. What a terrible thing it would be if this verse ended right here. If we would just be sad, lost, wandering, straying sheep, leading one another, and the blind leading the blind, and both going into the ditch. But it doesn't end right there. It doesn't end with the straying of the sheep. We continue with the sacrifice of the shepherd. Pick up with me again in verse 6. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, what a situation that we were in before. Oh, what a situation we are in, likened unto sheep. If we're left to ourselves and independently functioning on our own in this world, what a mess, what a bondage that is. But the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Just a few things I want to talk about concerning this tonight. And the first thing I want us to consider, as I looked at this verse, is the authority The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who else could have laid all of our sins on Jesus? No one but God. What a display, what an education on the power of God that we have here. And that He has the authority to lay our sins upon His Son. And he should. He should have it. Well, ultimately because he's God. But we can break that down and look at a little something, something in this. And that is God's the one that's, who's been sinned against. Oh, what this does to our life of confession and forsaking of sin. When we realize what David did in that our sins are not against others. They're first and ultimately against God. God takes it personal. David says, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Well, he no, he sinned against Uriah. He sinned with Bathsheba. Against thee, thee only. God, against you have I sinned. It's... It's God who has been sinned against. It's God's Son who is the sacrifice. So God is the authority of this sacrificial substitute in our place. No one but God has the power to lay our sins upon His Son. And His most precious Son, His most prized, valuable, dear possession, He laid our sins upon Him. Wow, what authority. But when you think about our sins being laid upon Christ, what agony. He laid all our sins upon His Son. This is exactly what the Bible says happened. Our sins were laid upon Jesus. What does it say? And the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. If all of our sins have fallen upon Jesus, they're not on us. Concerning the penalty for sin, it's only in one place. And it's on Jesus. That penalty is no longer on you and I. It can't be because Jesus completely took it. He completely took care of all of our sins once. He died once on the cross. He, there's no going back annually. There's no more sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat annually. Clear, which doesn't even clear the conscience. The Lamb of God was slain for us, for our sins, and it satisfied God. And our penalty was laid upon Him. It 
That word laid upon, it means to fall on, is one thing that it means. The remedy of the fall of man to sin is the sin of man falling upon Christ. That's the remedy, and there's no other remedy. There's much religion that says many other things, but the only remedy is that all of our sins fell upon Christ, and He took them, and He died for them in our place, and the Lord was satisfied. He took not only our sin upon Himself, but He took our guilt. Isn't that guilt horrible? I I remember the day I was saved. I remember that six months. And I remember the guilt. I, I, I I had no background. I had no foundation for all this to come together. Or, or it was my fault that slowed it down, whatever you want to say. But I knew that there was guilt there. There was such a weight of guilt. The cloud was so dark. Man, I was putting it together and I was realizing how sinful I was. And that guilt was lifted. It was lifted. I, I'm not going to glorify sin before you and tell you about my life here. But I tell you what, I could in one sense. And the fact that it's gone, that's, that's no longer who I am. I'm not everything that I'm supposed to be yet, but I am no longer that. And I'm no longer condemned by those things any longer. The guilt has been lifted. What a change in my life when, when Jesus came into my heart and He lifts the guilt. He forgives the sin. He's paid the penalty and the guilt is gone. Praise God, but the... And the agony of this, as we would see it, fell upon Jesus. He not only died for our sin, but He took our guilt. He not only offered Himself for our sins, but He became our sin. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Take the Bible for exactly what it says, unless it says something that appears to be different somewhere else, then you study it out and figure it out. He became sin for us. There is nothing else in the Bible that's going to say, well, no, that couldn't be it because He became a sin offering. Well, He was a sin offering, but He became our sin. Some people think that that the Father was with the Son through Calvary and, and through all the sins of the world coming, coming upon Him, but God's holiness didn't allow Him to be. It was in that moment that Jesus did take our sins, that the Father and Son were separated. Because of His holiness, He couldn't look upon the filth, the vile sinfulness, the darkness of sin, the, the blackness of sin that, that came upon Christ when the sky turned dark and the rocks rent, the veil was rent in twain. But during that time, there was a separation when, when Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was God having to turn while Jesus, who beca- whose God who became a man, went to the cross for us because man had to pay the penalty of sin. And Jesus did that for us. And God couldn't look upon the detestable iniquity of us that came upon Christ. God laid our sins upon Jesus. He consented to it. And He suffered, we would say, in agony. You know, what was agony for Jesus as we call it? is grace for us, though, while He gives us what we do not deserve. And He has gifted any who will with eternal life. It is the gift of God. Praise the Lord. Our punishment was placed on Jesus, the only one who who never sinned, He experienced the consequences of sin for us. He was slandered as a liar when He was upon this earth. Though everything that came out of His mouth was truth, He gave life, but there were those who wanted to kill Him. 
kind of makes you think about both sides of this that we're talking about tonight. The straying of the sheep and the sacrifice of the Savior. Jesus offering life. And there were those who wanted to kill them. Put them together though, and oh what grace this is for you and I. And though we call this agony, ultimately Christ looked at it as joy. What Christ did for us, He called it joy ultimately. In Hebrews 12 too, it says, Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus died a sinner's death in our place and suffered our sin upon Him. And He was looking ahead at the joy. The day that He saved this wretched old sinner, it was joy in heaven. What Jesus had to do, what He suffered, what He endured, is joy every time a soul is saved. Oh, the pride of of man that would keep man from from trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, of, of, of admitting what he or she is whenever Jesus just wants to celebrate the gift that he offers to you and I ever so freely. He died a sinner's death in our stead and proclaimed that he is the way. And get this, then you have those who are going their own way. We all went our own way, when Jesus is the way. You know, maybe there's someone here tonight, and maybe you've been in church a dozen times. Maybe you've been in church a hundred times. And if you'd admit it, it's still your own way. You participated in religion, maybe, but you have never come to Jesus' way and submitted to Him and received the eternal life that He gives. Because in our nature... We have to do it our own way. I sat with a young man in this sanctuary years ago, and he said, my life is nothing but a mess, but it's mine, and I know it. I know my life, and I don't know all of this you're talking to me about. Praise the Lord, he was saved. But what an example of in our flesh, we're just comfortable in our own way and doing our own thing. But Jesus says, he is the way. And, and maybe there's someone who has rejected Him for a while. Maybe, maybe you're here tonight or, or listening tonight and, and you know you're still in your own way. What forgiveness there is for you. What free pardon there is for you that, that Jesus would save you right now. You will in no wise be cast out if you will come to the One who is the way, the truth and the life and leave your own way. Just to, and just to interject, especially as I think about that message on mercy this morning, there's a, there's a little thought of forgiveness for the saved here tonight. That we would forgive someone who has sinned against us. As we consider this tonight, and our Lord, may we forgive someone who has sinned against us, that we are holding it against them. May we forgive them. May we cancel their debt because Jesus died for that sin and He suffered to pay the penalty for that sin. He suffered to pay for all of our sin. So may we cancel that debt from that one who has sinned against us. By the way, He not only paid the penalty but He paid the penalty for all. Let's end this tonight with the last word of this verse. The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. The truth is, Jesus did not select some people to be saved. He did not choose some people to be saved and choose not to save other people in this human race upon this earth. All are called to salvation. For God so loved the world. That, that's everyone. That's not, that's not talking about the land. Well, that, that's talking about everyone. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Jesus died for all. He tasted death for every man. That's every person there ever has been. That's every person there is. That's every person there ever shall be. No one is too sinful to be saved. No one has been in such a mild level of sin that they don't need to be saved. Everyone needs to be saved. No one's too young to be saved. No one's too old to be saved. For everyone in this room tonight, your name is whosoever. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is for all. What a better way to end this message. You know, I'm glad we didn't have to stop in the middle there. Because I was, I was being nice about us as these sheep, as, as we are so called. But, but one preacher just said, the sheep, are, they're dumb animals. As in, we're, we're likened to a, to a dumb animal here. Lost, helpless, wandering sheep. But, I'm glad it doesn't end there. There is a shepherd for the sheep. To make, uh, to make ordinary people something very extraordinary in Jesus Christ. He is a shepherd for the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Sure, we're sheep, but look at our shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for a perfect shepherd that we have in Him. Do you know Him tonight as your shepherd? Is He your personal shepherd? I know He's, he's the shepherd. And I know that you can call Him the Savior of the world. And that He died for all sins. And that everyone's a sinner. But have you had that moment where He died for my sins? And I want him to be my shepherd. That was John chapter 10 that I was quoting Jesus from about a shepherd. Jesus also says in that chapter, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you know the voice of your shepherd tonight? I'm not talking about anything audible. I'm talking about something that is completely silent, but very loud in your hearts. That you know the voice of your shepherd. He's, he's very personal. This God of the universe is a very personal Savior in Jesus Christ who we can walk with every step of our day. And we know that He's governing and He's changing and He's doing things in our life. And He's bringing about a morality and He's bringing about a love for Him. And He's bringing about a desire for His church above, uh, above anything more important than, than our jobs, our careers, or anything we do. That's what the shepherd is constantly speaking to Him. Do you know His voice tonight? I've never been a shepherd of sheep. But I heard that if two shepherds are passing one another with their flocks, they may stop and the two shepherds talk to one another for a little bit. And the sheep will just mingle and scatter all around. Stay close by because the shepherd's there. But they'll be just all over the place. And then when they say goodbye and they go to part ways, they give this little half second of a sound out of their mouth of a call. And every sheep that belongs with this shepherd goes this way with this shepherd. And every sheep that belongs with the other shepherd separates and goes that way. And not one sheep from this fold gets caught up in that one. And not one sheep from that fold gets caught up in this one. Because the sheep hear his voice. And they know the voice of their shepherd. Jesus Christ is a personal Savior. And you know that He has saved you from your sins when He is your shepherd. You have experienced that peace. Do you hear Him tonight? Do you hear Him in your heart? Do you recollect 
that you would be so lost without your shepherd that you would be off in the thicket and the thorns and you would be bound up in bondage if it weren't for your shepherd. Do you hear him? Do you know him? Do you love him tonight? Because Jesus also says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's impossible for you and I unless he's our personal shepherd leading and guiding us daily. Do you know the shepherd tonight? If so, you know that you're saved. The Bible says in the book of 1 John that we know if we're saved. We quote it a lot, so you can look up chapter 5, verse 13. Or you can look through the entire book of 1 John. And, and I numbered them in my Bible. I have 1 through 38 in 1 John. 38 times you find the word know. And it means experiential knowledge. This, this, this true religion is not distant. It's, it's very, very personal. It's very interrupting in a great way, in a very needed way in our lives. Do you know Him tonight? We're going to pray. And if you see yourself as that sheep and the way you started out, and there has never been that change that He has become your personal shepherd, and that He has saved you from your sins, would you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight? Would you trust Jesus to save you from your sins? I used to try to go into this theological presentation of the gospel, and a lady told me one time, I like what you said there, but could you have just said to me, trust Jesus to save you from your sins? I say, yes, ma'am, that sounds pretty simple and good. And that's what I say to you tonight. Would you trust Him and know Him personally? Is he, is he the Savior? And you know that information? Or is He your Savior? Is He your Savior? David said, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He didn't say He's the shepherd and we shall not. Let us pray. Father in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, we bow before your presence tonight in heart. And Lord, as we have looked upon the condition that every single one of us know, going astray from you, we are amazed by your great love in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. You took charge in your authority and you laid our sins on your precious Son. That He might be our way. He is the way. Lord, forgive us. Because we've gone our own way. And Lord, if there's someone tonight who is practicing religion but still in their own way, Lord, we pray you'd save their soul tonight. We pray for the children of God tonight, Lord, that you would move upon us, that as we consider this great love and this great sacrifice, the, the mercy that you have for us, if we're going to appreciate your mercy, know your mercy and love it, we're going to show it to others. Lord, we thank you for the grace you've shown to us in the gift of salvation. Dear God, continually be changing our lives for your glory. Don't leave us alone as your people till we serve you greater. Make us better Christians, Lord. And Father, if there be one here tonight that does not know the peace of salvation, the desire for you can't be found within them. It's because they, they need you to dwell in them and save them from their sins, Lord. We pray that you would have your will with your people, that your people would o obey the conviction that you put on their heart in this time of invitation. While, while all your people are praying to you, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.